Good day and greetings from the Great White North. My name is Prickly Poo and welcome to day 96 of A Year of Change. Today, when I was getting stuff ready for the video, um, I originally had an idea as to what I wanted to do. There was um, sort of a new study that came out. And as the internet normally does, it sort of led me to another link and another one and another one and another one. And things got all related and all jumbled up and everything else. And for a while, I looked as if I, it looked as if I was going to, I looked as if, it looked as if I was going to change the topic because I was just finding more and more and more stuff. Um, basically, what I started out looking at was a study on sugar and mice. Very simple study. It just was really interesting. Um, and then that sort of moved on to mushrooms and then that moved on to autism and a whole bunch of other stuff. Basically, everything sort of had everything connected, um, which is a bit of an, it's an odd stretch. So I'll, I'll explain myself a little bit better. Um, the, the one I'm actually going to settle on, though, is the study on the mice, just because it's a lot simpler and we can touch on the mushroom thing later and then the autism thing. And then later on, I can bring everything all in together. So what this was, um, the reason why everything sort of linked together is because they all had one common thread, and that was the bacteria in our stomach and our intestinal tract. Um, this stuff, which is basically just generally considered to be, they call it gut flora or microbiomes and all the other good stuff. Um, it's just the bacteria that lives inside of us that helps us break down food and sort of gauges nutrition and stuff. There's just a number of different, um, studies that are coming out now that are showing that these are also releasing neurotransmitters. Um, so the gut flora that you have can change things like cognitive function. It can change things. Um, it can, that's where the autism thing came in as well, that there's a theory that, that autism may be affected by this. Um, there was actually a special on The Nature of Things, which is a Canadian documentary show um, that quite a while ago that really sort of delved into that, and we'll deal with that one later as well. Um, but the main thing that I want to know, actually, you know what? No, we're going to change things up because I've already started talking about it. So, <laughs> here's, this is what I've been doing, you know, since yesterday, just trying to figure out exactly what I'm going to do. So, here we go. This is what we're going to do. Um, so, we're going to focus on that instead, because trying to just do one, like, I'll touch on the sugar one first. There was a study that was done on um, a high sugar and high fat diet on mice. So, before any of you alarmists get panicky and everything, they don't know what the effect has on humans yet. So, just this is just on mice, but they're looking at humans doing the same thing. And they realized that a high sugar, high fat diet can actually cause some brain problems with mice, to put it lightly. Um, they, in the study, they liken it to, um, you know, if you're driving home one day, you have a regular route to drive home, and the road is blocked. Normally, you can figure out, okay, well, if I take this one, I can go that way, and I can go around, and I can still find my way home. What they found is that with um, having that high sugar or high fat diet, there, it wasn't the same that we were split up into a high fat, high sugar, and then a control group. That the control group was still doing fine. The high fat and the high sugar diet ones did not have as good a time as the regular ones. And in fact, the sugar ones seemed to be much more damaging than the high fat ones. So what they sort of likened it to is the people with a high sugar diet, or the mice anyway, that if you were finding your way home and your road was blocked, you'd be fucked. You wouldn't be able to find your way home. Um, and the ones with a high fat diet basically would spend an extra two or three hours trying to find their way home, but eventually might find their way home. So that's putting it very simply. It's a, it's a weird analogy to put into it. Um, but it's how they tried to describe the, the impairment that happens. And this isn't something that, well, these, maybe these are just stupid mice. Um, these were, they were all the exact same and then they changed their diet. And this was the result four weeks later. So within a month. This is what happened. Now, they don't, they're don't they not saying that this is like brain damage or something like that. Um, it's just, it's, it's a change. That led me to another story that came out about this mushroom that um, I'm always very skeptical of these ones, these people that say, oh, well, it's, you know, medicine that's been known for thousands of years elsewhere. Um, you know, there's, yeah, they've tested all this shit. There's... There's a comedian, Daryl O'Brien, and I may have brought this up before, that had a very good bit regarding this. And he said that they've tested all this stuff, 
And the stuff that worked became medicine. So if it doesn't work, sort of gets thrown by the wayside. So when people say things like, oh, well, that's, you know, Chinese medicine for a thousand years, which I think is what this was. Um, and he made a point, a very good point, that a hundred years ago, like during the First World War, the life expectancy in China was 30. So this whole ancient medicine thing, and I'm not picking on you if you're Chinese, you're fine. What I'm just saying is that any of these ancient medicines, whether it's from China or Egypt or Babylon or wherever you want to go, um, Babylonia, no, Babylon, I think it's just, anyway, um, that all these ancient medicine things are at it from a time when people didn't know shit. They still assumed, well, you know, if you hover an egg over people, then it'll cure them. It'll draw out the sickness and put it in the egg and everything's good. So I'm always very, very wary about these things. But um, during the study, they looked at how, um, again, with mice, when they fed these to mice, um, alongside the same diet, so they ha they still have a control group, they fed the diets the exact same food, except for one group, they also fed this mushroom. Now, it doesn't actually say if the mushroom replaced a certain amount of the other food. From what I can gather, it looks as if it was in addition to it, so that they're still eating the same volume of food, plus the mushroom, not the mushroom replacing it. Anyway, what they found is that the mice that had the mushroom gained weight at a slower rate than the regular ones. So I think it was something like four grams for one group and then three grams for the other. Um, they're still fat mice because it was a, they were saying that, you know, it just sort of curbs that obesity thing. And again, this was sort of linked in with it changes your gut flora. We're just going to call that because it's a lot easier. Um, which, of course, reminded me of the autism thing from that I saw probably a year ago now, where they're, they were starting to look at the fact that in the human diet, um, when that flora does change or when the eating habits change, that's when you see this surge of autism in people. And part of the reason why they're looking at that is because they were comparing people in uh, like America and Canada, North America, basically, um, with other countries. And they said other countries don't have the amount of autism that we do. Um, but the odd thing is, and they figure that maybe it's an environmental thing, um, you know, or, you know, just a genetic thing. But what they found is that um, with families that immigrate to North America um, from any country, it doesn't matter where, you can take the occurrence of autism in those countries, when they immigrate here, then the rate of autism matches North America. So they started looking at the diet and things like that. And um, if you, I'll put a link down for the autism one just because it's very interesting. It's not really having to do a lot with food. I could put in a whole slew of links for all these things, um, which I think I probably will. But it was really interesting because it sort of pointed out, and there's one actually, I think I may have talked about this before, that... Um, there was a woman who was documenting she changed her son's diet completely just to, because it was a theory that she had that she had heard or read somewhere and there is a marked change in his behavior and everything else um they couldn't get funding for it and sort of regressed back to where he was before so there are some arguments for it and basically what it is it all comes sort of this is what my day has been like since yesterday and all of these sort of have one thing in common in that it's your gut flora and this is a batch of about 100 trillion bacteria that are in your stomach and your intestines. All animals have them. Um, and it's how you, basically how you respond to food, how, where you get your nutrients, they get their nutrients out of it. But what they're starting to look at is that they may actually be releasing neurotransmitters, that, which are basically just chemicals that affect your brain, um, that they think might be not exactly the cause but may have an effect on um, like obesity, autism, obviously, cognitive function. Just so we might, I mean, we're normally seen in the media. Fat people are always kind of perceived as kind of dim and they're always portrayed that way. They may not be too far off the mark um, because if we're eating a very high sugar, high fat diet, it can cause problems in mice anyway. So they haven't started looking at humans yet. 
Um, but the theory is sound, and where all these things are matching up, that's where things are sort of headed towards that. It's not enough to say, well, this is what's going to cause it. If you have a high sugar diet, you're going to be stupid. Um, but what they're looking at is basically just saying, there's enough evidence now to warrant looking into how this is going to affect people. And, I mean, this sort of led into a whole bunch of other stuff as well, um, like aside from the mushroom thing, that the gut flora itself can actually be transplanted from one mouse to another mouse, and then that new mouse ends up pretty much having the same weight characteristics as the first one. Um, now, how, you may ask, how, how, how do they transfer flora from one mouse to another? Well, it's kind of gross. Um, it's basically a poop transplant. Um, yeah, that's what they do. That it's because, obviously, when you're eating and everything's getting flushed out that way, so I don't know how they exactly did it, because I can't quite remember, um, but they transferred feces from one mouse who was healthy and eating the same sort of foods and moved it to another mouse who was kind of fat and logy and mm, and it started sort of losing regulating its weight that way um, and it goes the other direction as well so depending on what we're eating where we're getting that bacteria and how it's changing can have an effect on our weight, can have an effect on uh, neurology, can have an effect on a whole slew of different things, they believe. And it's enough evidence that they're now curious and saying, we should probably look at this a little bit closer. So for any of you that are thinking that, oh, well, if I cut out sugar, I'm, you know, I can win the spelling bee. It's not going to work that way. Um, I mean, it may not have as much of an effect on humans as it did on mice, but it's enough that it's, you know, they're probably going to start looking at it a little bit deeper. So that's what today has basically been, is just trying to figure out, okay, should I do the sugar thing? Should I do the mushroom thing? Which just sort of spread into everything. So we're going to focus on the gut flora. Um, now, to put it in perspective, you have less than 100 trillion cells in your body. Most of us. Um, if we're fatter, we might have more because there's fat cells in there. But... That's a one with 14 zeros after it, just to put that into perspective. And that's how many are living inside you. Um, everyone gets them from the time they're born, when they start eating, and it changes as you grow, things like that. Um, that was one of the things with the autism thing, is that they think that, um, or they, they know that during the first two or three years of life, that's when your gut flora is developing. So at the end of about three years, then that's you know based on your eating habits and everything else. That is when they're fully developed, everything's taken care of, and, you know, you're pretty much set. Which is, oddly enough, the same time frame when most autism develops. That's what sort of prompted them to start looking at diet and things like that, and, you know, the differences in immigrants coming here and they, them running into the same problems with autism. Um, and it comes from all walks of life. They just, whatever, whoever comes here, they, they, their autism occurrences tend to match ours. So I'll put a link for that one up there as well. Um, I know that's not really, I mean, sort of food related in some way, but very, very interesting to watch. So anyway, I'm getting off topic here. Um, but it is a very, very broad topic that can sort of encompass a lot of things. Um, I didn't want to sort of pick on just the sugar eaters among us, um, but that's originally what this was going to start with because um, I saw a documentary a while ago on sugar, which was a bit alarmist uh, for my liking. Um, I'll probably put it up later on. Um, maybe that's what we'll do tomorrow. But um, it just sort of led one into the other, and I didn't know how to break this up and to say, well, I'll just do the mushroom today, and then I'll do the sugar next week, and then try to bring everything all in, so I figured, screw it, I might as well do it now. So, um, I don't really have a lot of information on it. Um, <laughs> that's the problem with this, that because I've been sort of flip-flopping back and forth, trying to figure out what to do, I haven't done a lot of research. But, it's enough that I find it very interesting, that when you look at, starting just with the, the sugar aspect of it, they, and I know we sort of point at the sugar because it was also a high fat, blah, 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 a high fat diet, a hat diet. It was a high fat diet and a high sugar diet, but they did find that the sugar was more damaging. Um, and with the documentary that 
I'll probably put up tomorrow now. Um, although it was really alarmist, they s seemed to really vilify the sugar aspect of it more than fat. And there have been a couple of different studies recently that are sort of pointing more towards that. But I don't think it's because of the sugar itself so much as the sheer volume that we're eating at all times. Um, but we'll get into that tomorrow. Anyway, getting back to the bugs in your belly. Um, this is something that we all have um, that if you try to clean it out would be very damaging. <clears throat> that it does contribute to how we react, how our, you know, just in regards to food. Um, so this mushroom thing, I should actually probably go back to that. Um, they found that this one particular type of mushroom, apparently, and again, I'm assuming that they were fed the exact same amount of food and then the mushroom on top of it, because if they're eating the mushroom in place of a high sugar or high fat diet, then of course they're going to be thinner. That's just common sense. So I'm assuming that because of this thing, they had the control group and then they fed them the, ex the two groups, the exact same food. And then this third group, they would have fed just the mushroom. Um, it wasn't that they lost weight. It's just that they gained weight at a slower pace. So, of course, people now are screaming and going, oh, this is great. We can eat mushroom, this mushroom and then we'll be able to eat whatever we want. It doesn't exactly work that way. Um, whether it's a matter of saying, well, it makes you feel full um, it or it makes you poop more, whatever the situation is, if you just keep the, on eating the way that we eat and then eat this mushroom, you're still going to be fat. You're not going to be as fat as you would have been. Um, but, and I mean, you can sort of take the weight ratios into consideration. You would probably be like 80% as fat as we are. Um, but again, that's if you're a mouse. They don't know what it's like for people yet. What if it's poison? We could be, it could be toxic to humans. We don't know. I doubt it. Um, generally, if something is going to kill us, it's going to kill the mouse. So we're probably okay. Um, but it just sort of goes hand in hand with the sugar thing and the autism thing and everything else. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of information on it that you can look up. Um, I'll put links in the description below just to take a look. The sugar thing and the mushroom thing are very short. Um, so they're just little links to the news. Um, so you can take a look at those. I will put a link up for the study itself um, for the sugar just because it was very interesting. And I'll put up a link for the autism thing too. And anything else that I find. I'll, I'll do Wikipedia. I'll save you all the, your little searching thing and I'll just put a big list down below where you can take a look at all the different stuff. Um, it's just one of those things that, I mean, in theory, people that eat healthy and exercise right and all the other stuff, you know, people can always say, oh, well, it's their metabolism or well, no, they, you know, they prepare their foods and they're watching what they eat. Yes, that is a big part of it. But there's now some evidence that's leaning towards the fact that because they do that, it changes this gut flora. And that's also having an effect. So that, you know, their metabolism may be different than ours. Or, you know, they get different nutrients out of it. Or they don't digest stuff the same way. Um, and this can go anywhere from, you know, well, I was going to say artificial sweeteners, but we don't digest those anyway. Um, from sugar to fat to vegetables to mushrooms to tofu to like just pretty much everything so it's just there it's an all-encompassing thing which i think is really interesting and i know i haven't explained anything during this video i'm just realizing this now <laughs> i've just said oh here's what i've done the past two days which is nothing i've looked up stuff on the internet um but there's just a tremendous amount of information that you can go and take a look at and it's something that i found interesting anyway and hopefully that you will as well because it does have an effect on us so as these studies progress they may find that, you know, because we're eating a lot of sugar and a lot of fat, that it's not just causing us to be fat from the sugar and the fat, but because of the bacteria that's inside of us, that that's reacting to it in a different way as well. Um, or that it's triggering something in our brain that, okay, well, if we're eating that much, then, you know, why is it that other people can have a donut and be fine with it? Maybe that's part of it as well. It may not just be all psychological. There may be some chemical reactions, which is still psychological, but there may be some chemical reactions that are going on, oddly enough, from our stomach to our brain, which is very interesting. Anyway, it's more more information than I can obviously put into a 15-minute video. It's a lot more than you know I would be able to explain or understand, but it's enough that I found it interesting, and hopefully you will as well. 
So, and then we'll figure out what we're doing for tomorrow. So we'll just put that aside for now. There's a whole bunch of different stuff that went in today and it's not really focused aside from your bacteria. So enjoy your bacteria because I don't know how much it weighs actually. Um, I was going to say, you know, there's 25 pounds of it, but I think that's actually going back to a previous conversation with someone else, which is not bacteria. Um, but yeah, that's going to be something I should have probably looked up before this. But if there's a hundred trillion of something, then it probably has a substantial amount of weight to it. Um, and it's all through your body. So yeah, I'm going to say it's pounds, 11 pounds worth. There we go. That's a real number. So you can look it up, Google it. Uh, but for right now, that's it for this video. I know it's sort of off kilter and a little bit of everywhere, but if you sort of focus in on it and say, okay, it's talking about gut flora or microbiota, as it's called, ooh, it's a very fancy word, um, then it does have a little bit of a focus. Uh, I really wish that I knew more about it, but unfortunately, people with much higher education than I do have studied this in much more depth. But it's very interesting. This one, I'm going to put in a whole bunch of those links just so you can sort of go follow along with it and, you know, take a look at it. Just with nothing else, just to sort of sit and be amazed at how something so tiny can have such a big effect on us. But that's it for this video. So thank you very much for watching. If you liked it, please poke the like button for me. And in the meantime, keep yourself warm and fuzzy, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.